It's glad you're with us. Same for Larry Kruger, who joins us after another day in the sun in Santa Clara. And uh, apparently, he says, Larry, true or false, Brock Purdy looks different this year. Explain, Larry. Well, I mean, he's just, he's, He's he's in control. I mean, this is his show, man. I mean, last year, you know, first two years ago, obviously he was a rookie. Last year, he was a guy coming off a major injury, trying to kind of establish himself. This year, he's coming off of a Super Bowl berth, and it's his it's his show. And it's like he's the leader on the offense. He's the you can just see it on the field, much more so than the last couple of years for sure. What else is standing out for you from camp, Larry, about the offense? Ricky Pearsall, is he going to be the new wide receiver, too, with Brandon Ayuk being, I don't know, traded? <laughs> well, I don't think Ayuk's going to be traded, but um, unless you know, you're know you believing those guys in Pittsburgh who seem to think that <laughs> they're on the verge of, of trading for either Debo or Ayuk. But no, I mean, I'll say this. The Purdy to Pearsall is quickly becoming something. And I asked Shanahan about it yesterday. I said, you know, how happy are you to see these guys have this kind of chemistry? And it's just, you know, it's like it, there was reason to believe they would have the chemistry, but you just never know until you see them out there together. And now what they've repped it on the field and, you know, that you got a guy that likes to operate in the middle of the field quarterback wise, you get a receiver that's really good at freeing himself up in the middle of the field. And it, it looks like the Niners may have their version of Stafford to Puka. Uh, that the Rams had a year ago. Well, Larry, can I ask this? How can you tell in practice? Well, it's just that it's just that Brock and him seem to have like like Pearsall. Like I asked Shanahan about it, and he's like, "Well, Pearsall knows where he's supposed to be, and you know, Purdy plays on time and with accuracy, so the ball is where it's supposed to be." Now the question is. If the receiver's where he's supposed to be, then everything works out perfectly. And right now, and this is very early, but you're seeing these guys, you're seeing the effects of them uh, logging some serious practice field time. I don't know how much time, Mark. It's a good question, but uh, there's no question that they have spent time together, um, you know, throwing passes, and, and, and it looks great. You mentioned something about the uh, tight end position that I thought was interesting about who uh, the second tight end would be. Can you expand on who you think might be the one to to be playing behind George Kittle this year? Well, I mean, the guy that looks incredible. I mean, right now it's a it's a you know it's a wide open competition, but there's really only a couple competitors. I mean, we haven't seen uh, Latou because Latou's still you know um, injured and won't be ready till camp. Jake Tongues is more of a camp body, the former Cal Bear, nothing against Jake. Logan Thomas is interesting. He's a former quarterback. We'll see what he looks like. He, he was out there today. But to me, it's Braden Willis. Braden Willis is being utilized. They're flexing him out. Uh, they're throwing him passes down the field. He looks terrific. I mean, he looks like a player that has used his redshirt year and his offseason and put it to great use. Um, if there's a receiver other than Pearsall that looks like he's in lockstep right now with the quarterbacks, it's Willis. Uh, Larry Kruger joining us here on Willard and Dibs, 95-7 the game after another day of Niners mini camp, and we will get to all of the wide receiver stuff here in a little bit. One other thing I've noticed from your commentary, Larry, it sounds like you are really excited about the Niners secondary this year, in particular a bunch of the young guys. What, what are your thoughts on the way that's going to look? Well, I mean, you know, they lost two true alpha leader types when they lost Jimmy Ward and Emmanuel Mosley. I mean, really good players, but more than anything, guys who are like really strong leaders and very physical. And they couldn't replace that in midstream last year, but they went into the draft and they drafted Malik Mustafa and Renardo Green. And, and both of those guys look to be like that alpha type, you know, I mean, both of them look like they're going to play as rookies. Um, Hafanga had a, you know, was very impressed. I asked him today about Mustafa and he's like, man, he's beefy, but he's, he's, um, you know, he's a big body guy, but he's really, really um, explosive mover too. So, 
you know, so there's Mustafa at safety and, and Renardo Green at corner. And Renardo Green is just a, you know, they, how many times can he, you know, he called himself a dog like 15 times when <laughs> he was talking to Shanahan and Lynch. And everybody who talks about him says the same thing. But I mean, this guy is just, he's just an awesome competitor. He just comes to play. Um, they're bigger guys. I don't know where he's going to play. Is he going to play outside, inside? Is he going to play free safety? But, you know, the, what's pretty clear is he's going to play. So that's that's pretty encouraging. The other guy that just looks like a ton this summer is, or this spring so far, and we'll see what he looks like this summer, is Darrell Luter. I mean, Darrell Luter, I asked uh, Sorensen about Luter, and I just mentioned to him how, to me, he's impressive. And he's like, yeah, he looks an awful lot like Mooney Ward. And he really does. I mean, like, if you didn't know which one was Mooney and which one was Luter, you'd, they're stunt doubles. They're both big and tall and long armed and physically dominant. And, and Luter is just bouncing around. He looks fantastic. So last year was his redshirt year. He played at South Alabama. Maybe there's a little bit of a, a jump to jump from South Alabama to the pros. He had that knee injury until late in the year. Then he played a little bit, had that nice play on coverage in Seattle on Thanksgiving, but never really got into rhythm. Well, guys, this year, this is the year of Darrell Luter, and he looks terrific. I can't wait to see what he looks like this summer. Do you think that Ambry Thomas becomes the odd man out? Because I know they picked up Isaac Yadam and Rock Yassin, other depth pieces in the secondary. Is Ambry Thomas in danger of not making this team? Well, there's no doubt, Dibs, that they have a severe competition. I mean, most teams keep five corners, maybe six. The Niners have about eight. Uh, because, they, you know, the other guy that they really, you know, I, I think a lot of people didn't see coming was they signed Isaac Yadam, who played for New Orleans last year, and he played really, really well. So he's looked good in, this, in, this, in these mini camps. Long, rangy, experienced guy. They just have a lot of bodies. I mean, I still think Ambry's got as much talent as almost any corner the Niners have. In a lot of ways, he's the prototype physically. But he's just got a, the, the, there's just been dramatic inconsistency in his play. I mean, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know, but I mean, we've all just seen it. You know, it's like he's been, he's had some highlight plays, he's had some horrendous plays. So the, there has to be, he better show up in camp ready to fight for his spot because this year it's not assured. Um, all right, Larry, how do you think the IU thing plays out? I, You know, I, I listened to you right when I was getting in the car down in Santa Clara, and I, I couldn't, I mean, it's bad radio to agree with the host, but I agree with you completely. I mean, we've seen this before. The Niners would love it to get done early. I think uh, I think um, IU could love for this thing to get done, you know, between now and training camp. But the reality is it's not going to get done that way. It's... It's, you know, the Niners are tough negotiators. Um, I, uh, Parag is a very tough negotiator. My guess is that it gets done, you know, not before camp, not, you know, the day of camp, but like 10 days to two weeks after camp starts and maybe even later than that. I, I could see this being very much like the Bosa and Debo situations where they wait and they wait and they wait. They don't want to wait, but they can't help themselves because they want a killer deal. They want the best deal possible, and they're going to fight for every nickel. So that's the way it's going to go. I would, I think you're absolutely right. It gets done, you know, in August or maybe even early September before week one, but not at the beginning of camp. All right, then let, let's keep moving the ball forward. Let's say we're right, and that's how it goes down. It, it, do you also think that this is Debo Samuel's last year on the Niners? I do. I do. And, you know, and I'll say this, yesterday he spoke to us for the first time, and one of my main questions about the Niners going into this year is, what's the mental frame of mind of Debo? Because, you know, I don't care about the mental frame of mind of everybody on the team, to be honest, but certain guys, their mental frame of mind impacts the room. He's one of those guys. And he just was like, hey, you know, I'm just focused on this year. You know, we're trying to win the Super Bowl. We haven't gotten it done. Um, you know, I'm just focused on that and I'll let my agent and everything else take care of itself. And as long as he can maintain that kind of compartmentalization, if you want, of his emotions and feelings, I think that's great news. Because the one thing you didn't want to have this year and you don't want to have is you don't want Debo, who's a tone setting player, a leader in the room. You don't want him just pissed off in the corner of the room 
making himself an island. And I get the sense that his mindset is absolutely in the perfect spot. I'm just going to come in. I'm going to play hard. I'm going to control what I can control. I'm going to try like crazy to win a Super Bowl. And I'm going to let everything else kind of take care of itself. Shanahan said yesterday that he's looking to, I guess, diminish or limit the carries for and the touches for Christian McCaffrey. Do you think that means more carries for other people? Or does he let Brock Purdy throw the ball more than he did this last year? You know, that was my question. I said I, I confronted him with the fact that um, CMC had 339 touches. He, you know, he, is, you know, correctly pointed out that, you know, the running back spot, you know, you could have no design plays and, you know, there could be five pass plays and they're all check downs to the running back. And then all of a sudden he's got five, you know, targets. So, but he did go on to say that they would love, so I'm not, they're not committing to any number. Uh, being more or less than like the 339, but it sounds like they are committed to handing him the ball less. Like they're going to hand the ball to other guys. He's going to have fewer carries than he had last year. And I think his carries were right around like, you could check it, but I think it was like right around 279 or 280, something like that. His carries are going to come down. His touches might not, but his carries are. Larry, have you had any wink-wink conversations with anybody on the defensive side about the restructuring of the defensive coaching staff? I mean, we all have our thoughts who cover the team. Yep. And but I, you know, we, you know, you know, the locker room setup. We, there's not open locker room. I have many guys in the room who would talk to me, but it's a but they're at the, we're at the podium, you know what I mean? So we're in that stage until, until week one. So we don't really have the access from the players, but what, what are you getting at? Well, I'm getting at that. There were a number of conversations toward the end and the back half of last season that it made it feel like there were at least certain players on the defensive side of the ball who were just not jiving with Steve Wilkes's system. So you could even go back to last year, and, and, and what what I'm trying to ask is, does do do you think this group will perform differently and feel differently with a new staff? Well, I, I think that last year Wilkes was kind of, I don't want to say put upon them, but I don't think they were front and center at the table when that decision got made. W- listening to Fred Warner talk up um, Nick Sorensen today, um, you couldn't convince me that he didn't have a direct conversation with Lynch and Shanahan where he absolutely said, I want Sorensen and here's why, A, B, C, D, E. He's clearly a Sorensen disciple. It's clear that the players, specifically the linebackers, spoke up for Sorensen and wanted Sorensen. I don't think it was a hard convince, though, guys, because the, you know the Niners love their wide nine. They love Chris Kacerik. They didn't want to go away from that. So they wanted con- they wanted to try to maintain defensive continuity because they didn't want to chase off a whole nother group of coaches. They liked their coaches on all three levels, um, and Sorensen allowed them to get, you know to have that continuity. And then you got Staley there, who kind of allows them to have kind of you know a checks and balances, if you will, or at least another set of eyes on the defensive game plan. Uh, um, and I think that's probably a good thing. But it's all going to be about. How healthy is the relationship between Sorensen, who's a first-time coordinator, and Staley, who's a you know a failed head coach but a very successful former coordinator? Um, that's exactly what I was getting at. That kind of an answer. Yeah, I, that, that, that's interesting to me. Um, all right, Larry, thanks. Great stuff. Uh, fun question on the way out the door. You think Clay Thompson plays for the Warriors this year or not? No, oh. I don't. <laughs> No, I don't. I mean, I mean, I, I love Clay Thompson. Um, I think he's one of my favorite athletes in the history of covering Bay Area sports. Um, but when they offered him two years, $48 million, and he was disgusted by that, um, I was disgusted that they would offer that. So, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, when you've got people disgusted by the offer and him disgusted by the offer, that sounds like an impasse. And I just think that, you know, they say, Mark, it's easy for easier to handle different stages of your life if you move to different rooms. And I think that he would handle the twilight of his career better in Orlando than here. Uh, Larry, thanks, bud. We'll see you soon. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Hey,